All right, g'day everybody. Welcome to the giraffe prospecting session. We will get started here any minute. If you want to say g'day, drop a little comment in the chat. The chat is open. Holly, if you can administer the chat, that would be really helpful. Yep. Um, I think chat might be closed. I'm trying to figure out how to open it, but Q&A is open. Oh, great. Webinar, chat, Q&A, whatever it is. Uh, sounds good to me. Okay. Well, let's get started. Uh, thanks, everybody, for making the time. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, prospecting. And prospecting is a sort of a universal catch-all word for folks who are trying to use GIS data to find things, uh, generally speaking, sites, uh, obviously, but there may be other um, ways that you are looking to filter GIS data for things that you're looking for. And what we're going to show today will actually be kind of a catch-all for those uh, types of investigations. Uh, my name is James. I work here at Giraffe. Uh, Aaron and Holly are also on the call who work here at Giraffe. We would love to talk to any of you who are looking for a solution to help you navigate your site, or if you're an existing customer and you didn't even know this functionality was there, reach out. Um, we're also going to focus on the US today, uh, primarily because we've just released a data layer uh, via Regrid and Zonomics that's incredibly powerful for looking for sites, whether you're on the city side or the private side. It's a pretty darn powerful tool to help you sift through what's out there. So we'll sort of, we'll do a little bit of explaining on that data set, and then we're going to explain the home screen and how you can focus the table onto certain workflows uh, in order to accelerate and um, ultimately drive your top of funnel. Um, and we're going to play a bit of a role play, I guess. So that role play will probably focus on the property developer uh, personality, looking through sites. It's a very challenging time to find deals that work. And so we're all getting a little bit creative, moving from our traditional modes of working, which is highly relational uh, brokerage type investigations of sites through to, gosh, we need to find stuff that's off the beaten track, stuff that doesn't quite uh, come to us quickly and easily. And obviously, how do we do that? That's what we're going to talk about today. So before I dive in, um, just remember, if you have any questions, we want to hear them, put them in the Q&A, and we'll get to them as we go through. Much prefer this to be a uh, interactive type session. Okay, so let's zoom out. We're looking at my whole portfolio right now. And you can see the portfolio is broken into really three um, main ways of interacting with it. One is our map here. You can see all my projects listed out on the map. And as I hover over my projects, it's highlighting them on the table, which is beautiful. On the right hand side, I have deal cards. And these deal cards are, are basically a snapshot of where the site is, the site's boundary. But if we click on one of these sites, it's going to actually bring up the deal card. Um, and I'll put a little pause here and say, all of these metrics here, how we track components or features of a site that may or may not be interesting to us, these can all be controlled and managed by you or your administrator. So if you are going through one of these types of processes, definitely worth setting that up correctly uh, in order to have some great intelligence as you're going through this process. Once you have set those up, and, and that's very easy and trivial to do, but we'll cover that on a, an administration class as opposed to this particular class. Let's look at um, the table and just filtering our uh, projects here by their status. And status is just a field that we made up. But as we're collaborating across multiple offices, we have multiple people coming into our draft environment, we want to be able to, to cinch down on the information in our screen in order to make it more useful to us. So let's go to the status column and let's add a filter. I'm just going to say apply filter where the status is concept. And you can see very quickly that all of the other pieces of information update. Our deal cards filter down to just the deals that are on, in the concept stage. And the map obviously shows us the location of those deals. 
So we can go from a lot of information to some useful information really quickly. Um, and again, anything that we're tracking, we can use to create a filter on. So you may be filtering by number of apartments, you may be filtering on uh, zoning code or product type, doesn't really matter whatever information you're tracking, you can filter on. So let's remove that filter. And let's get into doing some prospecting. Uh, I wanna find a site now and create it as a record in my portfolio like this. And we're gonna target tracking just because we're, tr we're gonna track some sites here. So I'll dive into Dallas. You can see as I dive into Dallas, I've already done some, some due diligence on sites that we were interested in. Actually, I didn't do these. Um, my colleague Holly did, and she shared them with me, which is just a wonderful experience. So now I can see, okay, well, here's some of the sites that Holly thinks are interesting. And as I zoom in, I'm gonna get a lot more information than just the sites that Holly shared with me. And that's because we've added data layers to our home space. One of the data layers we've added is Regrid. And Regrid is a nationwide parcel and zoning index uh, that they have put together and is available within the draft platform. Very, very helpful. As I click on sites, I'm gonna get not just the parcel outline, but also the zoning information, the ownership information, the owner's address, whether it's an opportunity zone, tons of helpful things. But just like we were filtering on our projects, I may want to filter the parcels in the same cut type of way, particularly if we have an area that we're interested in and we're just looking for sites that meet a certain criteria. So I'm quite into this West Dallas area. Uh, I'm, I'm going to play the role of a pseudo industrial developer here. And I'm going to pop up to our uh, layers over here. And what I want to do is focus the table onto the regrid data set as opposed to my portfolio. So I'm just going to open the three dots here, hit open lens. And now the table is focused on parcels as opposed to my projects. Extremely helpful. I have all the same controls, but now instead of filtering on my own data, I'm filtering on a global data set or, a, you know, in this case, a national data set. So let's just spend a second talking about this data because it's an incredible data set and it's a partnership between two companies, Regrid and Zonomics. And one of the reasons we love working with Regrid and Zonomics is because they're both masters at what they do and they've done it at a national scale. Regrid focus on the parcel information, so existing land use, the ownership data, the tax roll information, the parcel boundary, uh, whether it's occupied or not, a... Um, uh, opportunity zone, does it have a flood zone? All the things that are very helpful and can be tracked at a parcel level, you can see as I just move across the um, table of fields that are available to us. And then Zonomics are a nationwide zoning database and they've gone and done the hard work of not just finding the zoning code that, that is in the particular parcel, but they've normalized those zoning codes uh, to give us some helpful clues that cross regional boundaries. One of the very, if you've done this before with county GIS systems, you'll appreciate how complex zoning codes can be. And when you cross the zoning boundaries, you've got to log out of one system, log into another system, figure out what their zoning code means. And regrids a helpful way to help us, a regrid zoneomics is a helpful way to, to normalize that data so that we can have one user experience between those different places. Um, Holly, I think it would be worth also linking to parcel schema. Um, premium parcel schema on that um, in the chat as well, if you get a chance. So let's do some filtering and some investigating. Um, first thing I may do is say, let's filter for a size of site. And if you've ever used a parcel uh, database, you'll know that the county doesn't always track the size. Very frustrating, uh, but Regrid does. Regrid has calculated um, the acreages of every parcel and makes it available to us as a field to use. So I'm going to say, let's add a filter to the regrid calculated parcel acres field. And it's a numerical field. So I'll say, show me parcels that are greater than two acres. And when I do that, Giraffe is going to filter out all the sites that are not greater than two acres. So you see all those single family sites are now gone. Very, very helpful. Now, 
there's tons of other data we can filter on and I may do that in a second. But before we get too carried away there, and I want to show you the zoning code links as well, let's just spend a few seconds talking about the other data sets that we have here and where they come from. So this particular space has uh, some national GIS data sets that we want to lay over the top. Um, part of the reason that we've done this exercise of bringing in data that is over and above just the parcel boundaries is because every location has nuances. Every location, whether it's in the United States, in Europe, or in Australia, it doesn't matter. There's always something that's local that a national perspective can't fully satisfy. So part of Giraffe's architecture allows you to go and add in bespoke GIS data sets to overlay, like kind of uh, trace paper over your prospecting view to get a fully comprehensive picture into what it is that you're looking at. So if we just take a few seconds to talk through these data layers here, we've got the regrid parcel data that has the normalized zoning code, the uh, parcel acreage, uh, the ownership information, uh, the land use, tons of other stuff. Then we have uh, coming from FEMA, these flood zones, and you can see all of these industrial parcels are actually in um, a, a flood zone, uh, but it's a zone uh, X. And so if you're into flood zones, we can talk about that uh, offline, but very interesting data set to overlay. And then we have the, the fish and wildlife data set coming in with the wetlands data. And you can see these wetlands corridors running through the floodplain, it makes total sense, but they also run through the non-floodplain and wetlands can be a nightmare uh, when you're doing a cyclone, uh, particularly when they run through the majority of your site like they do over here. Um, whilst it's less relevant in my home state of Florida, uh, but very relevant uh, across the board is contours data. We also have three foot contours. And again, this comes from the US Geological Survey just via a GIS layer. So if there's something else you wanna add in, you can just hit create your own data layer, add it in. One I found really recently that is extremely helpful is the national transmission lines data for power utilities. If you're doing data centers or industrial facilities, the distance to a um, node can often be, or a transformer can often be, a very pricey um, uh, thing to add into your site. So we've been running that. And then also for regular um, uh, sort of multifamily commercial, if you have a power line running through the middle of your low density site, that could kill your whole project. So all of these things, which certainly not, uh, our view here is certainly not fully encompassing everything you might want to look at, but hopefully you can see just from adding in those data layers, we now have an incredibly informed view of what we're looking at. All right, so let's go one step further and, and dive into the zoning data now. And again, if there are questions whilst we're doing this, please uh, please pop them into the, um, into the chat. And I'm just clicking around here now on the uh, parcel map. And I'll focus the table on, on, uh, on this again, just so we can see how we did it. I just hit the three dots, focus the table. And as we select parcels, you can see on the right-hand side, I'm getting the full deal card. Uh, I can understand the ownership information, the zoning, et cetera. Now, if I want to understand what the actual ordinance means, then we actually have a link here that takes us directly to the Dallas zoning ordinance. And I can see, okay, well, this is an IM, industrial manufacturing district. So let's just search for IM. And as we go through the document, um, we'll get you know our setbacks, uh, permitted land uses, uh, max FAR, max of density. It's all nicely formatted and laid out for us to interpret. And importantly, it has the actual verbiage, uh, as oftentimes the verbiage can be uh, the thing that kills us. Okay, so I am is a code. Let's pretend that I am is a code that I like in this region. I'm then going to add a filter that says only show me sites where the zoning code is IM. And again, we're now looking at sites that are zoned IM that are greater than two acres. So there's a ton here that is now within my exact purview. 
zoned correctly, so I don't have to go through entitlement. It's big enough, and we can see the kill the deal killers from the outset before we spend any time on it. And I can see my existing work. So that thing that happens invariably where we forget that we've looked at a site, we get all excited, share it with a colleague, and they go, oh, I looked at that site, just flood down the middle of it, don't worry about it. That's gone. We have retained now a global perspective on our, on our data set. Now, the other thing I might do here is just turn on the satellite and try and see where there are underutilized sites, uh, where maybe we've got an empty parcel or a parcel that is underutilized, potentially like this one, where we could fit one of our standard floor plates. So I'm curious in your process, what it would take to get to this level of investigation. And then if you get to this level of investigation, what's the next step? What's the next thing that happens from here? Well, typically speaking, we then pass this off to an architect, uh, assuming that we like it or a planner. So let's take this little guy here. I like this site. It's underutilized. It's very small. <laughs> and maybe this guy's underutilized actually right here. Let's just turn off the regrid for a second. Nope, not underutilized at all. Massive crosstalk. But let or um, front load, but let's pretend it is underutilized because I actually like this site a lot. So I'm gonna open up the lens again, click on the site, and you can see it's multi-tenanted, which is why there's tons of records. And what I want to do now is turn this into a project. And Holly, you're going to have to correct me on how I do this because I've never done it before. Wow, there it is down there. Cool. Add to new project. Amazing. So we'll say um, this is potential industrial development. And again, like we said at the start, all of those fields that we care about when it comes to tracking sites are now available to us to uh, change and put in our records. And we've got great data validation going on here because we can see I've only, I can't just type Atlanta and spell it wrong. Uh, and then it's useless from us from a database point of view. We've actually tightly controlled which markets we're operating in. So we'll say, great, Dallas. Yeah, we, we actually got to do the concept on this. And the project owner is me. The client is a big box distributor. Uh, the product type is an industrial uh warehouse um we we're not going to score it just yet although i think it'll score quite high out of 10 um it's not in an opportunity zone it's not in an etod it's not owned by the city but it is close to a highway and it is close to a railroad the railroad uh, you can see on the satellite runs right next to the site and uh it's not in a flood zone there are a little bit of wetlands and there's no slope so it actually is, it's scoring pretty well you can see i've just set these metrics up for me to be to get a helpful sense when I'm then going back through all the sites that we're tracking um, to make sure we've checked off these different things. Okay, so now I'm going to dive into that project. And the last thing we're going to do before we spend a dollar on this site, before we waste time calling somebody, I want to check whether I can fit my prototypical uh, front load warehouse on this site. Obviously, someone can you know, with a chamfered edge on the back. But we want to see if we can fit mine. So I'm going to go to my design library. And in my design library, I'm going to look for my industrial designs. And uh, in here, maybe I've uploaded this or maybe um, some, one of my colleagues like Holly, who's a design expert, expert has built out our prototypical designs. So I'm gonna take the front load here and I'm just gonna add it to the project. Now, this is a crucial little step as you may or may not know with Giraffe. When I bring in something from another project, not only is it gonna bring in the designs, but it's asking me, do I wanna bring in all of the data assumptions that underpin it, which may include cost data. So in this case, I wanna say, absolutely, bring it all in. We want to leverage every single piece of our previous work. And then when I hit OK, plonks it on the site. And we actually go, geez, our little front load situation here actually works extraordinarily well. And potentially what we should do is build a few of them. So I'm just going to 
copy paste them around the site. And uh, this, this may not be the best. In fact, we may go for a crosstalk situation. So let's go back to our design library. This kind of experimentation and thinking through how a site may work is exactly what Giraffe is designed for. So I'm going to just move this sucker around and maybe we'll drag him out a little bit. Boom. I love that. Okay, see how much we can get here. And then we're gonna draw our road network. Now, I still am gonna to talk to an engineer or an architect because there's tons of things that I have no appreciation of that we'll want them to understand. Like for instance, the grading or the, um, uh, or the drainage of the site. You know, we may find we actually end up having to put a retention pond up here um, so why don't we, before we invest too much time and energy, we certainly know we can fit a prototypical site. We know um, that there are no deal killers on the site, a prototypical design. There are no deal killers on the site. We like it. I'm going to stop here. I'm actually going to stop here and I'm going to share this out with my uh, architect or my engineer, uh, which in this case is going to be Holly. And I'll give her edit access so she can correct all of my uh, poor assumptions. And now she's got a chance to come in here and, and operate off the single source of truth. So let's go back to the very start and look at what we've done. Here's our new site. There are some of the ones we were looking at. And as I zoom out, we can see in the context of our whole, of the, our whole portfolio and where that project exists. So if we go back to sorting our portfolio say so let's show us the deals that are in concept phase and we zoom okay well let's look at those deals that are in concept phase oh there's that one we were doing uh over here in um west dallas that actually could fit enough square footage to meet our clients expectations so that's the whole flow and we may have jumped in and out of a few different personalities there um you may own all of that life cycle, or it might be a collaborative process between the different people in your organization. Um, whatever the case, I hope you can see how useful this can be to your prospecting workflow. So I'm gonna pause there for questions. Um, Holly, I don't know if there's people in the chat that are asking questions, but uh, let's just open it up for a few minutes for people to ask questions uh, and I can answer those directly. Yeah, definitely. So if you have a question, you can either throw it in the Q&A or you can raise your hand and I'll unmute you and you can ask it live. While people are thinking, I will show one very sneaky feature. Um, there is a very cool emerging feature within Giraffe that may or may not work it's a piece of r d but i'm going to add it in anyway and show it to you um, when you're doing data centers or industrial facilities like i said knowing where the transmission lines is is one thing but understanding where the transformers are is far more helpful that data set doesn't really exist uh, anywhere it's it's at least not that i've found if you know where it is i'd love to talk to you but we have a little bit of ai here uh, that, that we can use at this stage um, that go, uses uh, ChatGPT and OpenStreetMap together to try and answer some of these more difficult questions. You can see the transmission lines coming in. So I just want to ask it, where are all the transformers? And when I add that in, it's going to create its own data layer that shows us where the, trans, the transformers are, and the transformers it tracks, generally speaking, the substations. Uh, now, doesn't look like it's picking up any here, which may or may not be a surprise. I'll go to zoom out a little bit, Let's see if we can go here, try again, get rid of that layer. Always interesting when you venture into the R&D territory to see if this works. I don't think it's loving life right now. 
Um, Holly, do we have questions well, in the chat? We do. Um, so Thomas Flynn has his hand raised, so I'm going to unmute him first, Thomas. Uh, go ahead and ask your question. Hey, uh, James, Holly, I missed the introduction because I, for some reason the link wasn't working. So just the, the global question, is this, is this embedded in giraffe or this is a, a add-on? Great question. If you have the regret data set, everything we've shown you is embedded within giraffe. With the regrid data, data okay, layer. That's right. Yep. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Tom, Tom I'll um I'll send you an email uh about your particular arrangement. I I think you're good to go from memory. And then we have um a question from Peter about can you show the ownership details more in the regrid data set? Yes, absolutely. Good question. So let's go back to our prospecting view. And let's click on a site. So when I investigate a site, you can see on the right hand side, all of its details. Now, if it has the ownership detail, which more often than not it does, then it will be over here on the right hand side. And Sometimes it takes me a minute to see something. Owner name, there you go, CNL Foods. Now, you may be asking about ownership data because, whoops, um, often it can be obtuse, as in someone may have a shell company that they're using to protect the identity of the buyer. And in that case, there is actually um, a mailing address that uh, the owner has to submit uh, when they uh, purchase the site. And that mailing address um, often reveals who the real owner is, and that's unavoidable. Um, and that's down here, if you can see that. So that's also on the site. Um, and you can actually filter by owning addre owner address. So you can, um, like, let's take this owner, for instance. And I won't show it on the on the mailing address, but let's any of these fields you can you can filter on. So we'll say add filter where the owner name contains CNL Foods. You see, it's actually just that one parcel, um, and we we figured it was multi-tenanted, so that would probably explain that. But we'll go back to. Uh, Broom Turnpike West, actually, that could be an interesting one. So we'll say uh, filter where the owner name is. There you go, couple owned by Broom Turnpike West. So very interesting, particularly if you get into that contiguous parcels type situation. Um, instead of, if you find a site that you like, it's in a region that you like, it's worth turning on the, the layer to see what else do they own? What else does that owner own? Uh, and you can see this actually is probably the 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 um, information that's most relevant for like the parent company, uh, the mailing address care of. And you can see this that's a capital that's a REIT basically I think so let's put that in there and see. Yeah. So very interesting um, when you get right into the ownership data. Is there is there something that you particularly um, would like to see on the ownership side of things. Um, so he asked a follow-up question about email addresses and phone numbers. Um, and I, I think from my previous experience in development that generally those aren't, um, aren't public information, whereas most of the information within the regrid tax parcel data set is public information. So you do, um, um, unless you have other sources for those, you do have to, to look for those outside of the data set. Yep, exactly. And uh, there, there becomes a whole privacy type issue there, but um, certainly there are tools out there that can help you uh, get the, go from the mailing address to the contact information that are legal and are um, 
great resources for contact information. And then we have a question from Simon. Um, does, it, does Giraffe interpret the local legal code in order to verify potential for development, the FAR, the uses, the density, floor levels, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I do know with the new integration with Zonomics, a lot of that information is now contained in this feature service layer. But James, maybe you can speak more to how that works within your project design. Yes. Uh, look, the short answer is you is uh, in the short term. The answer is no. Would be the tactical way to answer that question. You can't yet filter on uh, allowable density. However, Regrid and Zonomics do have that data, uh, and that would be a logical next step for um, the partnership between our three companies, uh, if that makes sense. So no, the short answer is no, you can't do that, but it would be a uh, fantastic thing to have in draft. Um, just got a question from Peter, uh, if we can pull in a KML or a shapefile. Love Great that question. question. <laughs> Great question, Peter. Absolutely. If you hit add data layer, create your own vector, that will take any vector type, including KML or KMZ. And just to be a little cheeky, even a CSV of addresses, if you want to bring in your comp data. Simon, I'd love to um, take your question offline, uh, if that's okay. You can send me an email at james at giraffe.build. Um, let's have a discussion if you're still on the call. Uh, yeah, that, that's a great point, Holly, in terms of uploading comp data. Uh, yep. I may actually have a CSV of comp data that we could show how cool that is. Um, so let, if we just as a sidebar, I'll go into a project yeah. here. Yeah, pop into that project. And we'll say add data layer, create your own CSV, browse. I think I've got something here. So it's, it's always dangerous when you're looking through your files on a live Zoom. Okay, cool. So we've got some comps here. I'm going to pause my screen so I can investigate a bit more deeply. Um, Holly, I saw another question come in. Do you want to grab that while we're in? Yep. Peter's also also asking about um, HUD DDAs and QCTs. Um, oh, I think we on. do have some great HUD data already loaded, but um, they've also got great GIS layers on their website. They do. Um, Peter, the HUD data is awesome. Um, I'll, I'll abandon my uh, search for comps data because that'll just be a distraction. But let's go back to um, uh, looking at those overlays. And Regroup actually do QOZs. They have that um, already answered. So you could add that as a filter. When we go back to our Dallas prospecting. Um, but difficult to develop. QTAC, those are... Those are um, uh, their own GIS layers, generally speaking, which we actually have in drafts. So I'll, I'll add those in and show you. Uh, let's start with QOZ. So I'm going to add a lens to regrid. And then I'll say, is it a qualified opportunity zone? You can see there's the qualified opportunity zone. That's a true false. So we'll say yes. And it'll, it should filter out virtually everything on our screen right now. Uh, maybe not over up here. It's a bit laggy, actually. It's coming. So these guys are in an opportunity zone, which is cool. Um, but then over and above that, I know we have some great HUD data, so we can uh, look at HUD. Um, and oftentimes, what's in HUD, uh, the, or if there's something in HUD that's not in draft yet, then you can just go create your own and add the layer in here directly. 
um, difficult to develop, for instance, is a great is a great hard layer. And if we add that in, we'll be able to see the federal difficult to develop areas uh, load in. There they are. A lot of Texas is in that. There's the boundary of it here. And then again, of course, we could add in the opportunity zone map if we want to see it as well. Qualified census tract. Um, Peter, to answer your question, anything generally that's published as a GIS compatible source, um, if it's not in giraffe already, you can load it in and we'd love to show you how to do that. So, um, James, if you know if we have the California LIHTC resource maps, I'm not familiar, but um, chances are if we don't, we can we can help you load those in. Uh, LIHTC, just see if I recall. It's the low income housing tax credit, I think. Short answer is I'm pretty sure that data is public, in which case you can bring it in. Um, I can't for the life of me remember if we've got it already, but let's go have a look. Peter's doing the Lord's work here, linking us to it in the Q and A. <laughs> right of all. Uh, <laughs> it, that's federal, isn't it? Not California. I think it's federal. Uh, if we've, well, let's take that offline, and if it's a. I'm almost certain that it's a, a GIS data set, in which case you're just banging it into giraffe like all those other layers we showed you. Yep. Um, um, actually, I think we do have it. It's under low income housing tax credit, not LA. Uh, maybe not. Well, we're hey, looking uh, here. Um, we've also got a question from Sid about uh, doing five minute drive distance. So Ooh, great you want to jump over to another function here. Yeah, great question. Let's go. Let's go back to Dallas and we'll go back to our little industrial site. Um, we have this really cool isochrone tool. Uh, isochrones obviously are um, caches of travel distance. And I'll just turn everything down a little bit so we can see what's going on. Just like we added in our little sneaky bit of AI, I'm going to add in our sneaky isochrone tool, which is there. And isochrone, if it's functioning, lets us drop a pin. And that pin will then give us a drivable radius around a certain location. So as we look out, we can say, what's our travel time? It's driving. And we say five minute travel time around that site. Very interestingly, I don't think it's very accurate to be honest with you. Maybe it is, but. Yeah, I mean, five minutes is pretty small drive distance in. You can see it resolving. Yeah. This is, com this is coming from the Mapbox API. Uh, which is actually pretty darn good. So you see it gets quite far down the road there. We, it, it, I think I actually think my economies of scale here are um, much bigger than I yeah, anticipated. That, that building's really big. <laughs> but that's just wrong there. Once we get up on the road, it seems to, it's not going that way down the road. So um, I'd be curious to do it in another spot, to be honest with you. But very... Um, there you go, that makes more sense. There's a five minute isochrone. And if we want to turn that into a uh, an image that, or like a permanent layer, then we can just hit this save result permanent layer. And then that's something that we have as a, um, a sort of on off ability within our, within our layers, group of layers, which is actually kind of a cool workflow. So we'll have some folks who, when they're prospecting, and I'll show you what I mean. They'll turn these geometries into um, like a red or a hot zone. And they'll say, okay, I'm looking for sites within this particular hot zone. 
And then when we go back to regrid, you know, we just want to see what's within, you know, fault, you know, I've still got those um, filters on, so let's get rid of those filters. But we just want to look what's within our hot zone. And this is our, if all within a five minute drive of a school or um, distribution facility or an exit ramp of a freeway, whatever it might be. Um, we can start to have a look at what falls in our catchment. Amazing. Um, I don't see any other questions or hand raised. So um, I'll give you all 30 seconds to do either one of those if you've got a burning question. Um, but otherwise, uh, if you think of anything after the call, you can feel free to email us. James is just james at giraffe.build. Um, and we'd be happy to help you out. Thanks, guys. Thank you for attending the session. Hope it was very um, intuitive and easy for you to understand. We'd love to help you set this up for your investment thesis in your market. Uh, obviously, you can do it yourself, but we'd love to help you anyway. James at giraffe.build or just jump on the website, try the software, giraffe.build, hit the big get started button and knock yourself out. Um, thanks, everybody, for your time. We'll talk to you soon.